Welcome everyone. So glad that you're here with us today. Um, shout out to Now This News for live streaming our event and thank you to Kendall for sharing your artistry with us as folks filtered into our virtual room. Thank you, Kendall. My pleasure. Thank you guys. So I'm Liz Dozier and I am the former teacher and a CPS principal and now the founder of Chicago Beyond. Uh, Chicago Beyond backs the fight for equity and it has done so since its inception in 2016. We invest in leaders and organizations that are positioned to support our communities in real ways. Uh, from working with the third largest school district in the country, Chicago Public Schools, to develop the first of its kind blueprint for providing holistic trauma supports to over 300,000 Chicago students to authoring a 100 page guidebook why Am I Always Being Researched, which has been used in more than 70 countries, downloaded in all 50 states. Um, Chicago Beyond is leading uh, impact 
initiatives for our city and our nation. Um, we invest in everything from education to youth safety, community development, health and wellness, and beyond, um, because unfortunately, there is no single barrier to equity. So welcome to session three. That's a little bit about Chicago Beyond, but welcome to session three, unpacking race, wealth, and individual power. Just a few quick housekeeping notes at the bottom of your screen. So right there is where you can submit your questions. Just click on that. Thanks so much to all of you who submitted your questions ahead of time. I have got them handy right here and we'll be asking some of those. I'd like to invite you to notice two things, really just hone in on them. One is that as we, you know, have these type of conversations around, you know, race and wealth and privilege, um, they can be uncomfortable. And sometimes when things become uncomfortable, uh, it's easy for us to pull away or pick up our phone or get on the computer or sort of become distracted. And so I ask if you start to feel those type of things, that's when I'd like you just to lean in, stay present with us, don't look away, don't turn it off, um, because these are the conversations that we need to have as we think about <clears throat> 2020 and, and where we are and where we're trying to go. Uh, the second thing I just, I wanna just acknowledge that we're all on a journey. The three of us who will be in conversation today, um, Andre, David, and myself, we're no different than you sitting in whatever place and space that you're occupying. We're on our own individual journeys uh, of learning and just being present in our world today. So just to acknowledge that. A couple of goals for our session today. If you've been following our unpacking series, uh, you know that we started out with a conversation with Arnie Duncan and Christian Piccinilli where we talked about white privilege and, and what that really meant. In session two, we continued with that individual journey and we spoke with Ibram X. Kendi and Maurice Sweeney who uh, lead Chicago Public Schools Equity Office and really focused in on what it means to be anti-racist. And today we're gonna to continue that journey and it, it is yet an individual journey, but I invite you to begin to think and draw the connections to the larger systemic issues that underlie what we're seeing today. Um, and to understand the racial wealth gap as well as how we take action, but just, just digging in from both an individual as well as a policy perspective. So thousands of you have joined, just to acknowledge that uh, from across uh, the country, and it looks like even as far as Kenya, so welcome. Um, and I wanna have our guests, uh, our panelists, uh, come on screen. So we've got Dr. Andre Perry, and we've got David Axelrod, who are uh, joining us on screen. And David, are you there? Yes. Oh, yes. there you are. Uh, we need you on the video. We're good. <laughs> I'm able to start video. Oh, alrighty. So well, I'm that's wondering okay. if uh, someone there has, Post has asked you to start your video. Okay. There we go. Oh, perfect. There Thank you me. are. We okay. see you. We recognized your voice, but we see you. This is good. <laughs> so we only have, uh, we've got our hour long session today and I just wanna kind of dig right in. For our audience members, you can learn more about David and Andre. I won't go through their bios today, but you can Google them and find all the, the great things uh, about them. Uh, I just wanna jump in and David, I'd like to just start with you. Um, and. I want to kind of ground us in that Washington Post article. Um, and, you know, as I think about you and like what we, we know about you, I mean, you are the mastermind in, in helping to elect our nation's first black president. You've been a key player in mayoral campaigns across the country, including Chicago's first black mayor, Harold Washington, which was over three decades ago. And you even chose your college that you're gonna go to, uh, University of Chicago, because it was on the south side of Chicago. And so you've been someone who's been deeply ingrained in fighting for equality, but yet you wrote this op-ed. And the op-ed, for those of you who haven't seen it, it was in the Washington Post and it was titled, I thought I understood the issues of race. I was wrong. And you say in that when uh, uh, you thought you understood, you realize you did not and not well enough and not in the visceral way that comes when you truly imagine yourself in someone else's shoes. And so I'd love for you just to talk to us about what led to your journey and understanding that you did not understand and talk to us about the, the internal journey just prior to writing that op-ed. Yeah, first of all, Liz, thank you. It's great to be here. I um, so admire you and I admire the work that Chicago Beyond is doing and um, it, it's an honor to uh, 
uh, to be with you. Yeah, I thought I was pretty, uh, I thought I was pretty, I guess what young people would say now is woke, right? I, uh, I had spent so much of my life trying to break down barriers for people in, in, in the political realm, um, as, as you point out, dating back to uh, Harold Washington. I actually covered his first race for the Chicago Tribune and then worked for him in his second race when he ran uh, for mayor and then worked for mayors and Deval Patrick uh, in Massachusetts, President Obama, obviously. Um, and, um, and I felt, you know, I was raised in the civil rights era, uh, had great sensitivity to those issues, but I realized um, in the wake of George Floyd, and, and I should point out, by the way, the f one of my, I was a journalist before I was a political strategist. One of the, f the first column I ever wrote for the Hyde Park Herald in Chicago was a column about the battle between Congressman Ralph Metcalf and Mayor Richard J. Daley over police brutality in the black community. That was 47 years ago. Wow. Um, and we are still grappling uh, with those issues today. So um, yes, I, I had, you know, I felt I was aware, but um, the George Floyd murder um, really got me and many, many other people thinking about the reality that people of color uh, live with in our society every day, the conversations that parents have to have with their children that I never have to have. Um, but it, and it wasn't just uh, that, but, uh, but the COVID uh, pandemic and how uh, ferociously it has attacked uh, all communities, but particularly communities of color. Um, and it just underscored the vulnerability of those communities. And, and I started thinking about about why and studying more about why and uh, and the systemic roots of this. Uh, why is it, uh, w you know, w about the relationship with police and community, but also, um, and I know the subject today is about wealth, uh, about these, the long, long and horrific history of not just uh, uh, going back to slavery, but since and to this day of systemic um, inequity, discrimination uh, that deprive uh, our citizens, uh, uh, black citizens of uh, the same opportunities uh, that other citizens might have, the access to capital, the access to quality uh, education, the access to uh, uh, housing. Um, and, um, and it was really sobering to think about these things and think about how much I hadn't thought about them or how, how much I hadn't thought as deeply as I should have thought about them before. And I read this essay by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, which many of you have read in the uh, LA Times. And he had one line that I, I will never forget saying, racism is like dust in the air, in the sunlight, you can see it everywhere. And you know, what this year has done is it has really shown a light on racism in a way that you can kind of see it everywhere. Uh, and, uh, you know, on the subject of today's discussion, when, when white Americans have, you know, seven times the wealth on the average of black Americans, when, uh, you know, the median wealth of a, uh, of a white family is 10 times that of, uh, uh, of, a, of a black family, um, you know, these are, uh, you know, 13% of this country are black Americans, they have 3% of the wealth. These are not accidents. These are a function of long-standing policies that Andre has studied and will talk about uh, that we see to this day uh, that uh, have delivered us to this moment. And the question now is, what do we do about it? What do we do to be intentional about changing these patterns that have gone back for centuries in this country? And I think we've reached that point where that's the discussion we need to have. Agreed. And I want to I want to hone in just for a little bit on the, the point that you raised um, on, on wealth. And there's a particular line in that op-ed where you talk about a lot of white Americans thought they understood, but the underlying legacy of racism still remains. And the laws that were passed were hard won, but they didn't eliminate ingrained biases and the layers of discriminatory practices and policies that mock the ideal of equality. And I want to... Yeah. 
hone in on the idea of biases and layers of discriminatory practices and policies, that particular piece, and specifically as it relates to home ownership. I mean, we know that as we think about home ownership, it is what generates you know, generational wealth. It's one of the biggest drivers for Americans in, in doing so. And so I wanna start out with, with home ownership and I wanna, uh, I'd love for you to, to jump in here, Andre, on this. But you know, typically when we think about what's happened to one of the biggest wealth building tools, home ownership, we think about things specifically as it relates to Black Americans. We think about things in the past, like let's say redlining, for example. Um, but we we negate to really see what still happens and is still in existence today. And so I want, I know you have your new book out, which is called No, I'll just show it to everybody because it's really, really good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> know your price, pick, check it out. It is great. I've read it. I love it. Um, when you talk in the book about these uh, discriminatory practices and how it's impacted wealth, and not just wealth in terms of dollars, but also in terms of life outcomes. So maybe just ground our audience there. Yeah. Um, first, Liz, I want to thank you for having me. And, and David, I'm an admirer of your work. And it's um, always encouraging to hear that there are actually people who know how to work in coalition um, across racial lines. So um, thank you. Um, but I, a lot of my work focuses on um, wealth inequality and particularly I start with housing because housing is so interconnected with other policies. Uh, and so I, I had a, a few slides. I'm a I'm a fellow at the Brookings Institution, so you know we always have a few slides to show the data. <laughs> Just I, I, but I, I promise you, I will not bore you. So if you can pull up those slides, I can narrate them um, um, for us. Um, again, I, I'm just going to start with housing, and if you go go back, it, this slide you have the concentration of Black people in neighborhoods along the x-axis, so that bottom um, line, and then. Um, what you're seeing on the vertical is our, our, our home prices, how they're listed. And so you can see that when the concentration or the share of the black population is less than a percent, the homes are priced on average about $340,000. But as you see, the, as, the, incre as the, uh, the share of the black population increases, the price decreases. And in homes in neighborhoods where the share of the black population is greater than 50%, homes are about half as much as their white counterparts. But a lot of people will say that's because of education. That's because of crime. But those are things that you can control for. So that's what we did. We control for uh, education, crime, walkability, and all those fancy Zillow metrics. And if you can forward to the next slide, please. On average, after we got um, um, an apples to apples comparison, homes in black neighborhoods are, are roughly undervalued by 23% about 48,000 per home, next slide. Accumulatively, that's about $156 billion in losses. Now this is occurring all across the United States. Um, and, and if you can go back real quick, um, all across the United States, wherever you see a magenta circle, that's where housing devaluation, that, that little bar is cut off a little bit, but um, in the Chicago area, it's about 28%, about 38 or $36,000 difference between homes in, in black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods. And if you can go forward, the reason why this is important, um, yeah, um, if the reason why this is important, that we know that home, home prices fuels um, productivity and, and wealth building. In fact, 156 billion would have financed more than 4 million black owned businesses based on the average amount blacks use to start up their firms. It would have financed 8 million four-year degrees based on the average amount of a four-year degree. It would have replaced the pipes in Flint, Michigan 3,000 times over. It would have covered all of Hurricane Katrina damage. It's double the annual economic burden of the opioid crisis. The reason why I bring that up, when I wrote my book, I looked at where my father lived. He lived in areas um, where there was significant devaluation. He died in prison. And I am almost certain that if he, um, he was a drug addict, it, but if he lived in a white neighborhood, he would have had better schools, he would have um, more opportunities to start a business, more opportunities to go to college. That 156 billion is in 2017, not 2030. This is not accumulative, uh, 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 or this is not compounding over years. This is 2017. Next slide. 
That's why I say there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism can't solve. That we're constantly blaming black people for problems. That there's this white supremacist myth that states that the conditions of black cities are a direct result of the people in them. And so we need to look at policy instead of blaming people. Next slide. So this is a hearing where I testified on Capitol Hill. And if you can hit that arrow um, that will allow the start, this is what happened um, in that hearing. Oop, it's not being heard, but I'll narrate it. Well, the uh, um, representative Al Green asked, um, do you believe that discrimination exists? I was the only one that raised their hand. Then he asked um, for sake if that were a mistake, if you believe that they're not being discriminated against, um, would you kindly raise your hand? And um, as you can see, the appraisal industry, largely white, raise their hand. Um, next slide, please. And so that, that's it. But the, the point of this exercise was to show, and you can close that out. The point of this exercise is, was this just to show that not only does housing discrimination rob people of the material wealth needed for, those, for them to achieve the American dream? It also reinforces a harmful narrative that black people are at fault for the conditions in neighborhoods. And so we need to, one, restore the wealth that's extracted by racism and shift the narrative so that we can focus on policy. Thank you. I mean, I think that's huge. And that's why Chicago Beyond is doing these series. That's, that's, that is exactly what this is about, is about shifting narrative. It's about educating people. It is about allowing people to see truth in, in facts and in numbers, but also through others' experiences. I'm just curious, like, this is really to both of you, um, and from whatever perspective you want to take it and or lend your, lend your expertise from. But, you know, this is clearly um, bigger than, you know, telling people just to do better or to pull yourselves up by your, your bootstraps. This is a deep systemic issue that requires um, a, a huge solution. And so you've each spent your lives in different spaces and places, both of politics and journalism. And Andre, I know you have a background in education and all the things that, that you've done um, through Brookings. But like, based on each of your experiences during, you know, during your careers, during your just experience here in America, um, um, what do you suggest we do? Like, where do we go? Where do we go from here? Yeah, well, you know, uh, first of all, let me say, uh, uh, as I was looking at Andre's slide, I remember um, one of when I was a young journalist and uh, new to Chicago. Um, I remember, um, I remember traveling around the city, and um, I, I went to Chatham Avalon, which was a, which is a, you know, was middle class community, neat, neat lawns, nice houses, um, and I drive west to an all white community, and the houses were similar, um, and I'm sure at that, even at that moment, Andre's data was would probably have applied then, mm -hmm. which is that you know those homes on the southwest side were probably valued differently than the homes, uh, uh, you know, east of there. Uh, and of course they were east of there because the city was bisected by an expressway that was put there for the purpose of, of, uh, of, of, of keeping uh, African-Americans uh, on the east side and keeping the, the west of the expressway, um, uh, you know, white. Uh, but look, I, I think underlying this also, in, in addition to, that issue is just the issue of access to capital and loans to buy homes. You know, you, we talk about the historic nature of this problem. You know, you go way back to, um, you know, programs that we herald as great social advantage, uh, you know, advances of federal uh, home loans and, uh, and uh, v, you know, loans through the, the GI Bill for housing and so on. And they were really uh, and, and African Americans were largely excluded because of discriminatory practices from access to that capital. And I think these uh, communities, uh, you know, we have to solve that problem. Uh, I think that's a fundamental problem. You're talking, Liz, about a larger problem, and you're thinking in holistic terms, which is what Chicago Beyond does, which is why it's such a great uh, initiative. 
But this problem of access to capital, not just capital for housing, but capital for businesses, for people who want to start businesses and so on, this is the lifeblood of communities. This is the essence of fairness and equity. And we need to be very, very vigilant about addressing the disparity that continues to this day in discriminatory practices that may be uh, uh, less overt than they were in the past, but still exist today. You know, and, and I completely agree with that. You, we need to invest in, in black business owners, um, homeowners, potential homeowners. Um, again, it's the lifeblood of neighborhoods. We know that. Um, in addition to that, we need to remove the drags of racism on um, the economy. Again, the, my, my research that I showed showed that even um, when you control for these factors, homes are valued less. So when we do own homes, we're getting less value on them. And so that, that says that there's um, this a drag in the market that's, re, re, that's limiting the wealth building power. So um, there, are, there are certainly efforts to um, increase home ownership, but that, that's not far enough. We need yeah. to remove actual racism in the market. Um, and then there's this, and I'm, I'm certainly on the side of investment. Um, you, you will hear me say, um, echo um, many uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones when she says, cut the check, um, <laughs> when she's talking about reparations or anything, I believe in cutting the check. But th there also needs to be some racial reconciliation. No question about it. Um, it's far away. That's why I say that it's, um, we need to invest in um, black communities, black people. And I will say we should invest in people above place because if you invest in place and not people, you can, you can encourage gentrification or displacement. Um, but, um, but with that said, the current political discourse in this country is untenable. Um, and when you mix that with power that does not want to um, yield investment toward black communities, um, it makes it tough um, if you're a black person living on certain parts of Chicago, certain parts of Detroit, um, to, to whether or not you're going to see the kind of home ownership um, program that's really going to change things, whether you're going to see a, a new stimulus package or spending package that's going to actually address um, black businesses. Um, so, you, you know, first, we do need investment. But there needs to be some recognition that black people matter, black lives matter, because yeah. until we don't, you're not going to see the investment. The, the, the numbers I showed is really more reflection of how we value black lives. Mm -hmm. And that's that difference. And so um, I agree with David, we need to invest in um, homeowners, potential homeowners, business owners or we're, we're always going to see um, neighborhoods struggle um, with social problems and, and the like. Um, but I, I also think that needs to be paired with some racial reconciliation. Um, I will add, just qu quickly add this. There is an ignorance um, in America around these issues. We really do buy into this notion of the American dream as if policy doesn't create wealth. Mm -hmm. No, you know, we, we, we say pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but our data shows that there are people doing everything required of the American dream, but they're not benefiting from it. And so we've got to make that a reality by addressing the policy failures that leads to devaluation, discrimination, and the like. So let me just say um, that uh, I totally agree with you, Andre, and we're at a we're we're sort of at a pivotal point here uh, because uh, you know either we accept a politics that exploits racism, mm -hmm. uh, weaponizes racism, or we embrace a politics that confronts it honestly, and we do it together, and recognize that this is a responsibility. Uh, uh, of leadership in our country to recognize what a profound issue this is, what a profound challenge this is, and how long it's been, you know, how long we've waited, you know, mm. to, uh, to confront uh, that challenge. Uh, that said, we also have to confront the attitudinal piece is the harder piece in some ways. There, we ought to be able to, to address the structural things. You've done some great research 
Brookings has done some great research uh, based on the data that was available about how devastating, for example, it was for black businesses during this COVID mm -hmm. crisis in terms of trying to obtain capital through the PPP program that was designed to rescue small businesses. But because so many uh, black owned businesses, particularly small ones that didn't have a lot of employees, didn't have banking relationships with big banks that were assigned to distribute this money at the outset, they were delayed in getting money that was do them. Some of them never did. And 41% of those businesses across the country went out of business between February and April. Uh, and that is a structural issue. So, you know, even as we, even as we deal with the larger uh, driving forces of systemic racism, we ought to be relentless about addressing those things that we know we can fix yeah. uh, in terms of access to capital. Yeah, I just want to draw our audience's attention to this point, just in case they didn't know. But, um, you know, as we think about, you know, wealth generation uh, for Blacks in our country, like, you know, small businesses are, are, are huge in, in that respect. And as a result of COVID-19, the last stuff I read, and I don't know if you guys have more recent data, but nearly 50% of Black small businesses were wiped out as of April of 2020. So it has ravaged in, in incredible ways. And many Black businesses, for that fact, um, are still recovering um, from the 2007-2009 collapse. And so they weren't you know, prepared for the second period of, of economic uh, ramifications. And not to mention, you know, obviously, what, what you had said, David, about the PPP loans and banks as, as gatekeepers, we see this racial wealth gap uh, widening exponentially and that, you know, the drivers for a black wealth generation uh, slowly disappearing. I just wanted to, you know, put that out there for, um, you, know, uh, you know, Liz, that old expression when the, that, uh, that was said to me when I came to Chicago, when the black community, when the country catches a cold, the black community yes. uh, catches pneumonia. And there's a reason for that. You know, it's, it's why people, some people are more subject to become seriously ill from COVID because if your system is weakened, if there are systemic weaknesses um, that visit a community, um, they're, you know, they're more vulnerable to these kinds of dislocations. And so this thing kind of compounds on itself in a way that's really insidious. Yeah, you know, and I'll just add to that, that um, when the PPP loan rolled out, I knew that this would happen because as you mentioned, um, many black businesses um, are, are not banked because banking is a relationship driven entity. And, um, and, and what was interesting is that after just a couple of weeks of social distancing mandates, I heard white business owners say, we need the federal government to intervene. Now, try being socially distanced for generations. What does that kind of stimulus look like? What kind of package does that look like? And so, but, and I think of all the periods in time, the one of the reasons why you see a, a new multiracial coalition um, demanding justice is because COVID along with um, the, the deaths of George Floyd and obviously um, Breonna Taylor showed that when our, um, when our neighbors are sick, we are indeed vulnerable. And that is true economically as well. And right now, it, this is not an issue while I, um, I'm a black person, it is personal for me. I want to see equity, I wanna see structural change. But this is also about saving a democracy and an economy. We are throttling econ the economy every day we don't include major portions of the population. And so, um, but that's the irrationality of racism. People will cut their nose to spite their face every day, but. Um, we're at a point now where we can see an, an, a collapse of mainstream America um, if we don't treat the economy some, well, I was going to say like we're treating COVID, and unfortunately, we don't have a, a leadership in that area. But the, in, in terms of making sure that we all um, um, have to see ourselves as part of this situation, that we're all in this together. Yeah. But um, and when we do, and when we invest, and when we treat uh, um, each other as if we're all in this together, the economy will expand and grow. And so there's opportunity. This is not about um, I'm getting and therefore you don't. 
This is about um, ri uh, the rise of all boats. And so, uh, you know, we don't talk about th those opportunities enough. Yeah, I, I, th I thoroughly agree with that. You know, I think racism hangs from our society and our country like an anchor mm. uh, from our necks. And we're really feeling it now. And as the disparities grow, um, you know, it becomes more and more untenable. And this is, as I said earlier, this is not just a problem for Black America. This is a problem for America. Mm -hmm. And we have to address it. And we have to address it together. Um, you know, we, there has to be a recognition on the part of the broader population. And that, that was, you know, that was, to me, the encouraging thing about the reaction to George Floyd, the reaction to some of the some of the vast inequities of COVID, to see millions of Americans out there marching, to see uh, multiracial coalitions out there. But if all we do is march and assuage our sense of sadness, and there's no no action that flows from it, there's no change that flows from it, there's no substantive reform that flows from it then it really doesn't mean that much. And, and I think the jury is out now as to right. what the deliverables are gonna be uh, from all that goodwill. You know, and I, I just wanna add to that, um, I agree with you. Um, the rhetoric around protesting and, and legislation, um, we need to be clear, you need both. <laughs> you, need, you know, the, one of the, the beauties of the civil rights generation, they were marching and protesting while legislation was being done. And so these things coincide, but I mean, you need both. You can't have one without the right. other because you need the political will from the, the overall environment. You need that pressure, but you also just need law. You need legislation from federal level to municipal ordinances. Mm -hmm. um, and so those things have to um, work in concert if we're going to um, um, reduce racial wealth gaps and bring justice to people because you know both are needed. I want to talk a little bit about this mental model of risk. I think that you know as we as we think about um, whether it's you know loans or we think about housing we were discussing before there's just this mental model of risk that shows up and you see it across you know, again, when you're talking about loans, I see it in philanthropy and it's this idea that there's more risk if you will, placed on oftentimes black and brown individuals. Um, we know that it shows up in philanthropy, for example, in, in unrestricted funds. Like how much, you know, how much do we essentially trust the organizations to go and, you know, do their work without, you know, micromanaging every single dollar and telling them exactly how to do it. I think it shows up risk, you know, that same idea shows up obviously in, in home loans and other ways. And I just, I'd like us to just unpack that and help our audience understand what that is because as we think about both individual actions and collective actions I think if we don't talk about that concept and how it shows up uh, we're not doing ourselves uh, any good service there so we'd love to hear what you all think about that you know I did another study where we looked at business quality across neighborhoods and we scraped all the Yelp data my colleagues um, David Harshbarger and Jonathan Rothwell and Gallup um, we scraped all the, the Yelp data to give it a sense of quality. And what we found is that um, bl Black, Brown, and Asian businesses in Black communities actually scored higher on Yelp than their white counterparts, um, indicating that our businesses are just as, as good as strong. And there was a saying that you would hear the elders in Black neighborhoods, they would say, um, our ice is just as cold um, mm -hmm. back in the day. And they knew that if you bypass quality in black neighborhoods, you distort the market in the way in which low quality businesses have to compete with high quality businesses and you reduce economic mobility, you reduce wealth. Um, and, but the point is that our businesses are just as good, but we're viewed um, as riskier propositions, not because of the business quality, but because of um, they're surrounded by black businesses or the uh, owner is black. But I just want to be clear that our businesses are just as good. And our, the, it's, it's a sad statement, but um, the, the killer of George Floyd, um, um, I'm blanking on his name, um, but the, the, the officer who killed Chauvin, Officer Chauvin who killed George Floyd, um, he certainly had um, 
a certain cavalierness in which he killed him. But those same attitudes that led to George Floyd's death, guess what? Guess who else hold those attitudes? Lenders, mm -hmm. um, um, bus drivers, teachers. You know, that, those attitudes are pervasive. And those attitudes see us as lesser, as riskier, as um, not worthy of investment. And so we're, we have to, um, you know, th and this is why it's, you know, we do have to get at attitudes because narrative and, and, and attitudes drive investment. And if you don't have investment, they reinforce attitudes. So um, again, it's a vicious cycle, as, as David explained, it's a vicious cycle that if you don't invest, you reinforce negative attitudes. You have negative attitudes, you don't invest. But um, our, our homes, our businesses, they're, they're quality. And, and we need to just put that on the table. Yeah, you know, uh, where An Andre started uh, this whole discussion is another reflection of that, the fact that homes that are identical to homes in, in, in predominantly white communities would be valued at $50,000 less um, is another manifestation of this issue of risk. But Liz, I have another concern about this. It's not just how, uh, how the, the, the community, the investing community uh, views risk. That is a terrible problem that has to be addressed, but also the impact it has on the communities uh, of color themselves, and particularly young people in those uh, communities. Um, and, you know, I, I'm almost embarrassed to raise this with you because you've devoted so much of your life uh, to these young lives. But I, I was always moved by a discussion I had with Barack Obama when he was a state senator uh, representing the south side of Chicago. And, you know, one day he told me that uh, the most dispiriting, the most dispiriting part of his uh, job as a public official was going to, you know, uh, elementary schools and spending time with these kids in kindergarten and first grade. And he said, and they were filled with dreams about what they could be and what they could do. And then, you know, going to middle schools uh, and, and high schools and seeing so much of the, that hope and those aspirations snuffed out by what was perceived as the reality of what could be achieved. Uh, and those limitations are robbing us yeah. of so much young potential uh, that would is important, not just to communities of color, but to the community at large. You know, we are robbing ourselves of these, these young people. And by limiting their potential, we are limiting our own potential. And that is a, that's a, a great concern too. So um, it's not just about how uh, whites view the community in terms of risk, but about these kind of pernicious uh, viral impact of that on the community itself and how it views its own potential. I, I completely agree, completely agree. Absolutely. And to be able to, I, I, I sometimes wonder when I was a, you know, a, a high school teacher and also a principal, like if people could really just see and experience how that manifests in a, a young person's just day to day, like what simple things like, you know, what do classrooms look like? What resources do they have access to? Like all of these decisions that were made and how they translate to to our young people. And then the, ultimately like the repercussions that it has in their ability to like learn and, and fully like develop into the human beings they were ultimately meant to be. I mean, I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if people really get that. Right. You know, I, I do think there's, it's what Andre said earlier about this idea that it is just people aren't working hard enough. And if they just worked harder, if they just pulled themselves up, not pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. And that's why this conversation is so, these conversations we're having are so important to help people understand because the reality is, you know, we think about systemic things. And again, we think of them as some far off thing over there that we have no control over. I am yet one individual. But the reality is that, you know, we are a collective 
collection of individuals who allows this to happen in a society. And so um, it's just critical that we realize, we understand the implications of our, our individual um, decisions um, on our young people and on our communities. You know that um, I never let people forget, um, because I once did, that um, schools predominant uh, schools that are predominantly um, um, populated by people of color get twenty three billion dollars less than schools um, that are predominantly populated by white um, children twenty three billion dollars less the reason why I, I say I forgot that is that um, I was involved in in school reform and we we thought we could change the furniture so to speak without looking at the structure. Now, I think a lot of the, the, the reforms we, we had um, um, suggested were okay on its face, but you don't, if you don't change the structure, they never take hold. And in fact, if you don't focus on the structure, you blame the people mm -hmm. inside. And so that's why you saw in a lot of cities, um, black teachers being fired or let go because we didn't see the value. Now, uh, again, um, $23 billion less. I don't think there's any white parent who would say, I, I would change places with that, that, that family and um, work with those resources because I work harder. No one would say that. But so I, I bring that up. So we really do need structural change in how schools are funded. Because if you live in a district or in a sub-district um, with lower home values, guess what? You have um, less opportunities for high quality courses. You have less labs. You don't have um, computers. You, I mean, and we're experiencing this now. There are some communities where school districts are, are, are giving away computers and access to Wi-Fi. Some people need, and others don't. Right. And it's widening the inequality. So we have got to look at structures and not just sort of the moving the furniture around within an inequitable structure. Yeah. I mean, we can we can have a rich discussion about about school reform and how schools are administered and so on. There is no debate to be had about this disparity in resources. Yeah, uh, that is it, it, it is a grossly unjust thing. And it is what robs so many kids of their potential. And uh, you, you're quite right, Andre. Uh, you know, no, no white parent would say, yeah, I want my kid to switch places and have the opportunity that that black child has, at, you know, in, in, typically in a, in, in school, uh, in schools, particularly in our, in our urban communities. That's, it's just not fair. And Again, I just think the main thing is we have to think about this as our problem, our mm -hmm. problem, not just the problem of the, the black community. It is our problem yes. As, yes. A, as, a, as a larger community, and we have an obligation to try and solve it. And, and just one right. added um, to that, you know, I can't um, agree more. So the heirloom of segregation is really reflected in school district boundaries. I mean, mm -hmm. they were drawn to create inequality and we still have them. So it's gonna take innovative thinking, but it's going to take um, that thinking among all of us because we all want quality schools. We yeah. all want, for the, and, and we're just gonna to have to come up with new models, but we're gonna to have to come up with those models together. I want to switch. We have about 12 minutes left. I cannot believe how fast this has gone by. Um, we've got about 12 minutes left. And so I want to get to some audience questions uh, for the two, of, for the three of us. Um, so one is, uh, it says one of Chicago's biggest barriers to anti-racism and drivers of stu structural inequity is housing segregation. How do we address this in the short term? So we've talked about some of the long term. People want to know in the short term, what can be done? Well, for me, I'm a big fan of, um, particularly there are places in Chicago where uh, there are homes that are valued so low, or I should say in the Chicago Metro, not Chicago, but in the Chicago Metro, where homes are valued so low that banks won't back mortgages. So we need new loan products, new mortgage products to convert low um, income residents into 
um, homes. And, and that, might not, that, that not, might not sound short term, but it can be done. It can be done. Um, we can create new credit scoring systems. I think that also needs to be done. Um, a lot hinges on this election because I do believe that we have an opportunity to create programs that will stimulate the economy and solve some of these problems. Remember how we got, uh, how we got out of the depression was essentially investing in poor people. We just didn't invest in black people. So we invested in poor white people through home loans and, and, and the like, and the GI Bill. And in summer, we can do the same with legislation, but I, I, you know, I'm encouraging everybody to, to, to register to vote and to vote. <laughs> Um, so that we can have that opportunity. Um, and, and, and also micro loans um, to current homeowners because devaluation robs people of the discretionary money to fix up their, their, their homes and, and invest in their community. So I, I, I think the, the short term is around investment in different forms. Yeah, I'm not gonna, I don't have that much to add to what Andre said other than to observe that um, uh, one of the things that I've witnessed over my now almost 50 years in Chicago uh, in the last few decades is the depopulation of our communities. Mm -hmm. We've seen gentrification in some uh, communities that has driven uh, that have driven has driven families out. And we've seen disinvestment in communities that has driven families uh, out. And what we need is a real investment in affordable housing mm -hmm. yeah. uh, in the community so people don't have to flee the community and don't, don't get priced out of their community. Yes. yes. Oh, and, and, you know, one, one other thing, you know, remember municipalities are still some of the largest landowners. Uh, and, and so this is where mayoral and city council leadership steps in. You do need to create new zoning ordinances to build in affordability and density in areas that make sense. But it's a battle, as most people know, it's probably one of the hottest political issues um, you, that any uh, po politico will face. But it's something that city leaders can do more of. And, and so um, I, I would also just look at where we can um, zone for these kinds of things and, 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 and put in investments in those areas. Uh, this question also came in, it says, in your opinion, uh, why has it been so difficult to unpack and eliminate societal segregation, even as we approach the quarter century, quarter century mark of the 21st century? I know we could have a whole history lesson in this, so we don't, we don't have to go that deep, we don't have to just, but to, and you know, from, from each of you, if, you, if you'd like to share something there, but why has it been so difficult? I mean, um... You know, again, I, I would yield to Andre. I would just say, and this is what I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, you know, it, it we we've talked about the the sort of program programmatic things we can do, but as we said earlier, it's the attitudinal thing that is at the core of this. And if, as has been the case throughout our history, starting you know, way back to 1619, if there is a pervasive sense of of, of white superiority, of white supremacy, even among people of goodwill, uh, if there is this latent sense that uh, that the that 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 people of color are lesser, or in some way less capable, or le that uh, that is a pernicious thing, and it just pervades everything. And the real question is, so so I think you know, yes, we you know we're sitting here, we're what. Uh, Brown versus uh, Board of Education 65 years ago, we're, we're still having this discussion about education. We've done, we've taken steps forward and we shouldn't gainsay this, the steps we've take, taken forward, but unless attitudes follow, yeah. uh, we're never gonna complete the mission. And it's the attitude we have to, it's, it's attitudes and, and perspective that we have to change. Uh, and given 400 years of history, that is, those are substantial headwinds that we are contending with, and, but, but we have to contend with them. You know, you know when President, well, then um, nominee Trump in 2016 was in Diamonddale, Michigan, I believe, um, and he gave a speech there, not, I mean, it's about, I wouldn't say 90 minutes outside of Detroit, 
and he said to the mostly white crowd, um, but he, he, he was addressing it to black Detroit. He said, what do you have to lose black America? What do you have to lose? And when he said that, my, my stomach just um, curled because it, it, it was an assumption that there's nothing in black communities. Now, that makes absolutely no sense. And from a housing perspective, $609 billion of housing assets in, in black communities. The thousands of businesses, thousands of schools, people, you know, so, but, and, you know, you wanted to say that's just Trump, but no, lots of people, Democrat, Republican, share the view that there's nothing in Black communities. And so for me, um, you, you get there by investing in Black communities. I don't think you get to a level of care until you invest in something. So you have to invest. But we've got to deal with this attitude of there's nothing in Black communities, that, that it's so dire, that that we need um, to change. No, I, I say this all the time, that there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism can't solve. We must address the policy. And a lot of these things will shift, but um, lots of people just have this view that there's nothing there. And therefore we won't look at leaders in black communities to help. We won't look at um, black um, um, investments um, strategies. Um, and so for me, that's just a pernicious attitude that is pervasive regardless of party yeah and and look i i just think that if you have a if you if your leaders uh prey on promote uh yeah. practice of politics that is rooted in white supremacy yeah. as a philosophy uh you know you you're not you you it's very very hard to solve these problems we need the opposite that's right we need the opposite and i think a lot of the country is saying that not all of it obviously uh but i think there is a hunger for uh, a, a a different dialogue and a different understanding and you know but we need leadership that understands that and activates it I think I would just add to that. I think that I agree with both of you. I think the reason why we haven't, we've yet to get there has a lot to do with, you know, as we think of the concepts of a truth, healing, and reconciliation. Um, before we get to those latter, we have to deal in truth. And I think up until this point, you know, we're, we're having conversations about the basics around racism and how it impacts and is like built into the very structures and into policies. And people are still unpacking and learning and coming to accept the truth. And I think that's why a huge part of why we're still uh, where we are today. And hence why uh, Chicago Beyond is engaging in these conversations and um, welcoming us all into this journey of learning and unpacking uh, and knowing something different and doing something different. Um, so we have got three minutes left. And so um, I wanna keep on time and honor people's time. And so I guess I will just ask you to close out um, you know, aside from voting, uh, we know everyone, please go to your polls, vote, uh, not just in this election, but every single election being an informed voter. Um, what else can people do? Your 30 second answer. And then I'd also like you to leave us with uh, what, what gives you hope? What gives you hope amidst, amidst all of this? So whoever would well, like to jump in. Go for I'll it. just grab onto the last part. Um, what, I, know I work with young people every day at the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. Um, what gives me hope are, are young people um, because I think that they are so resistant to this narrative. They are so eager to change the narrative uh, about race in our country, about inequity in our country. Um, and um, I, I think that they have the power to do that you know, if a bunch of us just get out of the way and uh, give them support. And so I am, I am hopeful about the future. I am worried about the present. And, um, you know, the, the quicker we get to the future, the better. Um, uh, Liz, can you hold up my book and read the title of that book? <laughs> hold it up. No price. <laughs> Go get Know Your Price, available where fine books are sold. No, the, yeah, no, I, I will say that I, all, I will agree with David on this. And it, but it, it, I get encouraged every time I see the protests and I see the complexion of the people in the protests. Um, mm -hmm. It's very different mm -hmm. um, than in the past, very different. 
Um, I'm about 50 years old. I've never seen this kind of multiracial coalition um, ever. So that gives me hope. Um, I, I do think that we need to um, leverage the protests with policy. They go hand in hand. Uh, and so, um, but man, every time I go out and I see different people of walks of life um, protesting, demanding Black Lives Matter. My son, who is nine, we, we live in Washington, D.C., and um, we live near um, Black Lives Matter Plaza. And when it opened, we, of course, went down there. And my nine-year-old got to hear different people shouting, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. And I, I don't know what impact that's going to have. I can only assume it's going to be positive impact because kids don't learn, um, I should say, kids learn more by um, action. You know, it's better to, uh, to show, and show than to tell. And, and he heard Black Lives Matter. So I was encouraged by that. And I, and I think we all should be. Yeah, I totally agree. It gives me hope. Our young people, but then also being in our communities and seeing people every single day still um, fighting for us, still believing there is a better future and a better tomorrow, and that each of us, no matter where we sit, can create it. So uh, with that, I want to close us out. Thank you both for being with Thank us you. at Chicago Beyond. I'm just so grateful that you chose to spend your afternoon with us and just encourage all of our audience members. We'll be sending out a uh, quick toolkit after this with additional readings if you want to continue to stay informed and kind of broaden your own knowledge base and encourage you to join us for session four. Be on the lookout, subscribe to our social media channels or our emails and we'll be sending you uh, information for session four. And last but certainly not least, I have to say that I, I talked to my mom last night and she says, I tune into all of your sessions, Liz. I'm trying to, I'm trying to learn, I tune into all of your sessions. And she, she said that every time she tunes in, she waves. And she's like, but you never wave back to me. <laughs> so I'm waving back, mom. <laughs> As are David and Andre. They're Hi, mom. <laughs> all, right. <laughs> all right, guys, have a great day Thank and you. take good care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.